In this episode of How It Was, we will tell you what vaccination looked like in the 18th century, who taught doctors to wash their hands, to whom we owe painkillers, and how Wilhelm Röntgen showed death to his wife. Let's go. You are very lucky. In our time, the chances to live to old age are higher than ever. In less than 200 years, the average life expectancy has almost doubled. For example, in 1841, the average life expectancy in England was 42 years old. In 2011, it reached 82 years old. How come? We mostly owe this to the development of medicine. The average life expectancy statistics was mostly undermined by high infant mortality. Before the 19th century, about one in four babies died before turning one, usually from infections. What helped to reduce child mortality was the invention of vaccines. Few people still remember smallpox today, but as recently as a couple of centuries ago, it was one of the most terrible diseases. In the 18th century, 300 to 400,000 people a year died of smallpox in Europe alone. The death rate reached 30%. Survivors often went blind because of the complications. The principle of vaccination was first discovered by Chinese physicians in the 16th century. They crushed dry scabs of patients with a mild form of smallpox and gave the resulting powder to healthy people. Other prescriptions included injecting fluid from the patient's ulcers through the nose. Thus, the person was infected with a weakened form of the disease, which was easier for the body to handle. People usually had to pay to get the procedure done, so most doctors would pass the secret to correct inoculation onto their children, so the profit would always stay in the family. The more adventurous characters tried to perform the procedure on their own, stealing scabs from severely ill patients. As could be expected, it ended in death in 15% of cases. Variolation, a method of deliberately infecting a person with a mild form of smallpox, was also known in the Ottoman Empire. A baby would have a small incision made on its skin and scabs from another baby would be put there. The child would then get sick with a mild form of smallpox. The scabs would be collected and transferred to other children. Europe learned about this practice from English aristocrat Mary Montagu. She had gone through smallpox herself, with her face remaining scarred. In 1716, Montagu and her husband headed for Istanbul. There, she saw children being inoculated against smallpox, and the idea got her excited. Montagu started with her own kids, and as soon as she returned to London, she started spreading information about the procedure among the aristocracy. Gradually, variolation gained recognition in England. Over the 18th century, it gradually became more and more common in Europe and America. However, variolation was not entirely safe. While the death rate was lower than that of the regular infection, 2-3% to of vaccinated people died. Furthermore, after variolation, the patient could spread the disease, which sometimes led to an outbreak. Could the procedure be made safer? The problem was resolved in 1796 by British physician and natural historian Edward Jenner. Jenner observed farmers infected with cowpox, a disease related to smallpox. It turned out that after going through cowpox, which was less dangerous, people would not contract smallpox in the future. Jenner's further experiments proved this. The novelty was generally well received in society. People had already gotten used to variolation, and the new procedure produced the same result, with lower risks. There were still critics. Many feared that getting a human sick with an animal virus would lead to unforeseen results. Over time, smallpox vaccination became mandatory in the army and navy, and the King of Spain even equipped an expedition to deliver the vaccine to his American possessions. The principle of vaccination was later developed by French chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur. In the 1880s, he invented vaccines for rabies and anthrax. In the 20th century, there were vaccines developed for many other dangerous diseases, measles, polio and tetanus. This is not the last that we hear of Pasteur because he was also involved in another major medical discovery, antiseptic. In the Victorian era, it was believed that the infection was caused by poisoned air. To find out how Jon Snow was fighting against this theory, make sure to check out our video about pandemics. 
Until the mid-19th century, doctors did not really care about the cleanliness of their hands because of their false ideas about the nature of infection. It was absolutely normal to dismember a corpse and then go deliver a baby with those same hands after a quick rinse. The death rate from peripheral fever would sometimes reach 20-30%. In 1846, Hungarian doctor Ignaz Semmelweis started working in a Vienna hospital. There were two maternity wards in the hospital. They were hardly different in any way, but new mothers died from the fever three times as often, in one of them as in the other. It was so bad that women would sometimes rather give birth in the street than end up in the first ward. What's the problem, the doctor wondered. Eventually, he managed to pinpoint the crucial difference. The second ward, the one with the lower mortality rate, had obstetricians in training, while the first one worked with medical students who also had anatomy classes. Semmelweis forced everyone to wash their hands with bleach solution before delivering a baby. It worked and the death rate in the first ward dropped dramatically. In medical circles, however, Semmelweis became an object of ridicule since he didn't manage to provide convincing scientific proof of his discovery. This led him to a nervous breakdown and isolation in a mental hospital. Before his death, Semmelweis said that his only regret was that hundreds of thousands of women could have been saved if he had gotten through to his colleagues earlier. The theoretical justification appeared almost 20 years later. Louis Pasteur's experiments in the 1860s shut the lid on the issue, proving once and for all that most diseases were caused by germs. Soon after, British surgeon Joseph Lister started applying disinfection during operations, relying on Pasteur's experience. Using carbolic acid and sealed bandages and washing instruments while treating the wound, doctors were able to reduce mortality to just 1 to 2 percent. Of the 40 people who had undergone amputation, at least 35 now survived. The germs were gone, as was the pain. That's because anesthesia appeared at about the same time as antiseptics. People knew about the analgesic properties of certain plants back in ancient times. You can find out more about this in our episode on the history of drugs. However, there was no comprehensive knowledge of pain relief until the mid-19th century, which made surgeries a living hell. Kidney stones were removed through a perineal incision. With laudanum introduced into the rectum, amputations had to be completed in a few minutes, since the patient could not stand them to be longer. Patients were finally relieved of pain in Boston on October the 16th, 1846. On that day, two American doctors performed a public operation to remove a submandibular tumor. Dr. William Morton anesthetized the patient with diethyl ether, a substance previously used only for recreational purposes. The patient approached the inhaler and took several deep breaths. Feeling good? He passed out. Coming round after the operation, he said, it was like a scratch on the neck. Morton tried to hide the fact that he was using a commonly known substance, going so far as to patent it under the name lithium. It did not help him though. Soon enough, American and European surgeons were widely using the ether in their operations, while Morton himself was accused of attempting to appropriate someone else's invention. Shortly after, other anesthetics started appearing. A year after the first demonstration of ether, chloroform was shown to the public for the first time. By the way, the method of applying chloroform was improved by our old good friend John Snow. He developed an inhaler that enabled the doctors to measure out the amount of inhaled substance. John Snow even had a chance to use chloroform on British Queen Victoria during childbirth. She liked it. At the end of the 19th century, doctors also mastered local anesthesia. At first, cocaine was used for this purpose, and in 1905, Novocaine was first synthesized, which remains in use to this day. Humanity has overcome pain and prevented a huge number of deaths from traumatic shock, but even more lives were saved by the discovery of blood types. England, 1665, the peak of the scientific revolution. In 20 years, Isaac Newton would publish his famous Three Laws of Motion, but for now, Dr. Richard Lower was demonstrating successful dog-to-dog -dog blood transfusion to his colleagues. After that, experiments on animal-to-human blood transfusion followed. They mostly did not end well, and three years later, the practice was prohibited. In the middle of the 19th century, about 50 episodes of human-to-human -human blood transfusion were documented. 
and about a third of them were successful. These experiments were eventually systematized in 1900 by Austrian doctor Karl Landsteiner. He took his own blood and the blood of his staff, mixed them in a centrifuge and observed how red blood cells would stick together and settle. That's how three blood types were discovered. A little later, Landsteiner's students discovered the fourth one. For putting blood transfusions into practice and saving millions of lives, the doctor received the Nobel Prize. Landsteiner's birthday, June the 14th, is celebrated as World Blood Donor Day. A few years before that, there was another discovery that was awarded the Nobel Prize. We're talking about X-rays. Before the discovery made by German physicist William Runchen, surgeons frequently had to use beaters, saws and chisels for breaking bones which coalesced incorrectly after a fracture. At the end of 1895, Runchen experimented by sending current through vacuum tubes and thus he accidentally discovered a previously unknown type of rays. The physicist quickly realized that the X-rays, as he called them, had a huge potential and sent letters about his discovery to doctors that he knew. Within just a few months, X-rays were used in surgery for the first time. Runchen refused to patent the technology since he believed it morally wrong to profit from a discovery that would save so many lives. This allowed everyone to experiment with the new rays and led to a burst of growth in physics, medicines and related fields. When Runchen showed his discovery to his wife, taking an X-ray image of her hand, she said that she saw death. We may not show you something quite as exciting, but we promise it will be interesting. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our newest videos.